today we're going to be talking about celebrity endorsements and consumer incentivized blogging. Um, these are two real key areas within advertising in recent months and years. And within the advertising team here at Bristow's, we've seen a pretty seismic shift um, in the last couple of years away from traditional advertising media, which includes things like TV, radio, print and billboard, and possibly as a consequence in the, in the downturn and a squeezing on advertising spend, um, a lot of uh, marketing pounds and dollars has, has shifted online, um, and principally to social media advertising and promotional campaigns. Um, within social media campaigns, what we see a great deal of is either celebrity endorsements um, or Joe Public consumer blogging and endorsements. Um, many will know, watching this video, that in the US, uh, celebrity endorsements have been big business for almost a decade now. Uh, the likes of Justin Bieber and Lady Gaga and the Kardashians have had a pretty high profile and are actually making a great deal of money out of promoting various goods and services. Um, it has been reported that Kim Kardashian, for her 140 characters on Twitter, gets paid around $10,000 per tweet. Um, so that just stands as an example of how much money there is to be made in this area. Um, so we're going to look at celebrity endorsements and the rules and regulations here in the UK. Um, but in my view, an area that really is developing is what our peer group are saying about goods and services. So whether we're looking at booking a holiday and we want to know what our contemporaries are thinking, or whether we're looking to buy a new camera, we might go on for recommendations and, and look at pretty high profile blogs that may be discussing uh, consumer products. So again, um, at the end of the talk, we're going to be looking at members of the public and how they're interfacing with uh, blogs and tweets as well. Um, in terms of celebrity endorsements um, here in the UK, the principal battleground is the Advertising Standards Authority and the advertising codes that, um, that they've created. Um, it's, it's fair to say that um, many will say the ASA can be a little toothless because they don't have powers to impose fines or get injunct injunctions or put directors in prison. Um, but if you're serious about your brand and your advertising integrity, um, I think um, that you should be playing by the rules. Uh, um, the remit now of the Advertising Standards Authority um, has been extended into online space. Uh, for some considerable time, they were looking at things like banners and pop-ups paid for online space. But in the last couple of years, they're now looking at marketing communications on websites, uh, but also through social media channels. So the obvious ones being Facebook and Twitter. So an expanded remit, and, and if one looks at the decisions, a great deal of them are within the online space. Um, as I said, that the sanctions, um, the principal one to consider is the naming and shaming. Um, and if people are interested in this particular area, um, I'd recommend you go and have a look on a Wednesday morning at the asa.org.uk site. Um, and I think you'll agree that there's certainly a trend for the ASA to look more at online marketing and specifically social media. Um, as another footnote, um, before we look at some specific examples here in the UK, um, again, as I said at the outset, um, celebrity endorsements in the US is a massive business. And for that reason, um, the ASA quite sensibly has taken a look at how the regulator has dealt with these types of issues in the US. Um, a number of the provisions uh, mirror almost directly um, some of the guidance that's been provided by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission in the US. And again, if this is an area that you're particularly interested in, I would recommend uh, that viewers go and have a look at the FTC guide on celebrity endorsements. So in terms of the ASA code, um, it's the CAP code uh, that one really needs to go and have a look at. And specifically, if you're embarking on celebrity endorsements, um, you should look at um, the three uh, principal provisions that are on the slide before you. 
Um, documentary evidence is required that there's some commercial association between you as the advertiser and the celebrity. Um, that also applies to members of the pub public in terms of having um, documentary ev evidence signed and dated. Uh, but certainly it applies to celebrities and is more often than not dealt with under a standard talent agreement. Um, it's also worth noting that claims are likely to be interpreted as factual um, if they are made by the celebrity. Um, an example here would be if you had Justin Bieber uh, promoting or endorsing your skin cream, if Justin were to go out on Twitter and say that it cleared up his skin in 10 minutes, then if somebody put you to proof as the advertiser, that would certainly be a claim that you would need to substantiate. Uh, you couldn't avail yourself by saying, well, that was just Justin's opinion. Um, if he makes that statement and it's as a consequence of an agreement with you as the advertiser, then you will need to stand behind that claim and back it up. And that's why you should keep quite close controls um, over celebrities that are endorsing your product in terms of the messages that they're putting out in the marketplace. The final point to note um, is that marketing communications must be obviously identifiable as such which sounds reasonably straightforward, but as you'll see from the examples in a moment, um, this is the area where advertisers most often trip themselves up. Um, so really it's the deception in the minds of the consumer or the recipient um, of the tweet in terms of whether it's advertising or whether it's actually the celebrity's own opinion. Let's take a look at some specific examples. The first um, that we have to look at here in the UK um, involving celebrity endorsements and Twitter was a Snickers campaign. Uh, many would have seen the TV campaign which involved Joan Collins, but in terms of the Twitter campaign, uh, Mars um, behind Snickers used Rio Ferdinand and Katie Price, aka Jordan. Um, this was the whole you're not yourself when you're hungry campaign which was getting celebrities to act out of character or make statements that were out of character. For example, Rio Ferdinand was tweeting out um, after a Man United game that he couldn't wait to get home and do some knitting. Um, thereafter he put out another tweet suggesting that he was really disappointed because he didn't have enough wool in the house and therefore had to go to the shop and ultimately uh, Rio then put out a tweet which was the reveal tweet um, as we describe it, which actually had the um, you're not yourself when you're hungry, the campaign tag, um, at Snickers UK, hashtag hungry, hashtag spawn. Um, and similarly, um, Katie Price, Jordan, was indulging in similarly out of character tweets. Uh, Katie Price was making reference to Chinese monetary policy and also various other highbrow economic issues. And again, she had a, a well, actually the same reveal tweet as Rio Ferdinand, which her third tweet, all within one hour, which is important, um, again had at Snickers UK, hashtag hungry, hashtag spawn. Now, complaints were made uh, by members of the public to say, well, we didn't know that this was actually an advertisement. We thought Rio Ferdinand was just um, you know, making his own comments or Jordan um, uh, Katie Price was making her own comments and it wasn't necessarily clear that this was part of an advertising campaign for Snickers. Well, helpfully, the ASA looked at this in some detail and they said that because the three t tweets were within one hour, um, and because the reveal tweet had hashtag spawn, which denotes some form of sponsorship or promotion, um, they actually decided not to uphold the complaint. And they said that it was clear to consumers and recipients of the tweets that this was part of an advertising campaign. It's probably worth noting that um, had the tweets gone out randomly over the space of a week or two, it might have been more difficult for Snickers to get away with it. Um, I think it is material that all three tweets um, had an element of continuity and the reveal tweet came fairly quickly. So those watching the earlier two tweets would connect it with the reveal tweet, which also lets us all know that it was a Snickers promotion. So that really put down the marker in terms of using celebrities through Twitter. 
and therefore they made it clear that you could use handles like hashtag spawn, hashtag ad, hashtag promo that would alert consumers to the fact it's an advertisement. Later um, in the summer, in 2012, um, we had Wayne Rooney and Jack Wiltshire, uh, two very well-known footballers, um, some supporting a Nike campaign through Twitter. Um, in this particular case, we had both Wiltshire and Rooney um, presenting their New Year's resolutions. Um, and this time, it wasn't as clear that this was actually a marketing communication. Um, at the end of Rooney's tweet, um, there was the hashtag make it count. And to be fair to Nike, um, there was also a reference to a Nike URL, but it was certainly afforded less prominence. Now again, complaints were made because some people felt that it was confusing as to whether Wayne and Jack were making statements off their own bat and just giving Nike a plug or whether it was part of a coordinated Nike campaign. In this instance, it's worth noting that there wasn't the hashtag spawn, hashtag promo, anything like that. And the tweet itself was somewhat conversational, i.e. something that, that Jack or Wayne may well have said. Um, in this case, the ASA decided to uphold the complaint. Nike lost this particular um, adjudication um, on the basis that it wasn't sufficiently clear to the recipient that this was advertising. And again, the ASA said, had they included hashtag ad, or had it been obvious to the recipient that it was an advertisement, they probably would have got away with it. So again, it's, it's worth looking at in contrast to the earlier Katie Price Rio Ferdinand Snickers decision. Learning from their um, mistake uh, committed earlier, Nike, um, just over a year later, so at the end of last year, um, actually had another complaint brought against them in terms of a Twitter campaign involving Wayne Rooney. Um, this time, um, however, the result was different. The tweet itself um, going out said, the pitches change the killer in instinct doesn't, over the turf anywhere, at Nike football, hashtag my ground. Now, in this particular case, although people that were paying attention a moment ago will again note that there was no express reference to hashtag ad, hashtag promo, hashtag spawn, um, the ASA felt that it was very clear, given the context, that this was a punchy strap line almost marketing speak, and then hot on the heels of that, you had at Nike football. So again, unlike the somewhat conversational tone of a New Year's resolution, um, this was obvious in the ASA's view to the recipient um, that this was a Nike promotion, and accordingly, the complaint was not upheld. So again, although we have guidance that the hashtag spawn, hashtag promo, etc., can be used, it's not so prescriptive that in the right circumstances, as long as the recipient un understands the tweet to be an advertisement, you can still get away with it and use it quite sensibly through Twitter. Um, I won't bore you with many other examples, but safest to say there are a number um, for those that are interested. Um, there was a Gemma Collins of TOWIE fame, ASA adjudication not too long ago. Again, with Gemma giving a plug to Tony and Guy at Lakeside. Again, it wasn't immediately apparent that she was incentivized in some way to make that tweet and the complaint was upheld. And more recently, there's also been one in involving Adele. Um, so watch this space. Um, undoubtedly, there'll be more to come. So that's dealing with celebrity endorsements. And I think, again, in my view, I feel we're fairly cynical in terms of celebrities being involved with promoting and endorsing product, uh, products. Um, where I feel there may be some, some more deception and harm is in the space where we look to our contemporaries and consumers at large in terms of what they are saying about products and services. Um, and similar principles apply. In terms of the battleground, well again, in the right circumstances, a complaint might be made to the ASA, but in most instances, and most attention and spotlight has been put on the consumer protection from unfair trading regulations, which 
among other things, it has been put in place to harmonise consumer law and help avoid misleading and deceptive messaging out in the marketplace. Unlike the ASA, where we spoke about the sanctions potentially lacking some considerable bite, the CPRs, as they're described, um, has some pretty dramatic uh, consequences if you fall foul. Um, Trading Standards or the OFT has powers to uh, put out to put um, uh, to put fines in place um, to also make injunctions. Um, but it's also worth noting that there's no direct enforcement under the CPRs. Uh, what I mean by that is that you have to get Trading Standards sufficiently interested or the OFT sufficiently interested uh, in making a complaint rather than bringing a complaint off your own bat. Um, and I think it is fair to say where resources are stretched that sometimes it's difficult to get the OFT or trading standards interested in advertising type matters. That said, I do think this is a, a growth area and we do have some guidance in terms of a recent investigation that we'll look at in just a moment. In terms of the parameters under the CPRs, again, similar to the ASA code, um, it needs to be apparent that um, you're not um, lacking information within an advertising campaign to the detriment of the customer um, or the viewer, um, the recipient of the marketing communication. And what I mean by that is, again, if it's an advertisement, if it's an endorsement, um, then the consumer should be made aware of that. Um, it's not just formal payment that might be made to a member of the public to make a positive statement. It could also, as we'll see from the investigation in a moment, it could be some benefit in kind. So in terms of guidance in this area, what do we have? Well, not so long ago, um, the OFT off their own bat, so this wasn't as a consequence of a consumer complaint, but off their own bat, their con uh, consumer protection unit focusing on online matters, decided to take a look at a website called Handpicked Media. Um, some of you may have come across Handpicked Media, but a general description is that it's targeting and focusing on women and women's products and services. So you might routinely see blogs and reviews by members of the public um, around makeup or handbags, pretty much any product that appeals to ladies could find itself discussed within the confines of the hand-picked media website. Um, in this particular instance, um, it came to the OFT's attention, or they had some concerns, that some of the blogging activity wasn't truly independent, and rather some of the bloggers using the site were being incentivized in some way. Now, it was unclear as to whether these members of the public were actually paid a fee to make positive remarks about products and services, but what was admitted by handpicked media was that there was some benefit in kind, and whether that be a free handbag or a free cosmetic set, of course, um, when one receives something for free, um, there's every chance that they might say something nice about that product. And that was the rub in this particular case, and this is what the OFT are attempting to avoid that if there is some payment or some benefit in kind, that needs to be disclosed to members of the public. Otherwise, it can be deeply deceptive for you or I if we're looking at a similar site uh, when we're going to think about the purchase of our next camcorder, for example. So in this particular case, no fine was imposed against handpicked media. I think it was really an opportunity for the OFT to put down some markers. Um, and in this case, they just sought undertakings from handpicked that in future it would be very clear to users of the site wherever a blogger was incentivized in some way. And again, this needn't be overly prescriptive, but it might be something along the lines of if I were blogging, I might say, thank you to the people at Canon for the new camera, this is what I thought of it. And then people reading that will not necessarily feel it's a wholly independent view of mine, but they can make a weighted assessment in terms of whether I'm just saying it because I was given a free Canon ca camera or because that's what I actually think. So a very important decision 
and an area that I think will continue to develop. Um, as I said at the outset, I think increasingly we're, we're all using travel sites to do some research on locations and hotels, etc. And I think it's fair to say that there is some concern that some of the comments made on such sites are not wholly independent. Um, I think the hand-picked uh, investigation and others to come will make a real attempt to try and clean up this particular area. That's really all I had to say today in terms of celebrity endorsements and messaging from members of the public. As I say, when it comes to social media, this is a really hot topic. In terms of a couple of takeaways, um, when it comes to celebrities, I think we've got some very helpful guidance from the ASA in terms of using things like hashtag ad, hashtag spawn, hashtag promo, to make it crystal clear to recipients that this is an advertisement. And again, when it comes to Joe Public, um, our contemporaries, our peer group, um, again, the hand-picked media example gives us, again, some pretty hard, fast parameters in terms of ensuring that consumers know that bloggers, uh, tweeters, people that are putting up their own posts are incentivized in some way. Thank you very much.